Now recording. 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 Yeah, John, you know, it's a really fucking upbeat story for uh, for a week in which, you know, we're like up against World War Three again, by the way. <laughs> uh, Is it really that bad? <laughs> <laughs> Craig's laughing maniacally. Uh, like you're bringing a baby into this world. This world's going to hell in a handbasket, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that really is how I feel. But you know, yeah. awesome. Case okay, sera sera, right? Well, if there's uh, any antidote to the end of the world, it's a story like this. That's completely frivolous. Yeah. But it's also, I don't know, it's kind of, I thought it was pretty deep, dude. It is, it is deep. That's the thing, it's it's a really deep story disguised as a really frivolous story. Um, yeah, I want to hear what you think about, like, when when we get, up, get to it, like, the overall message is, that's happening. But, um, uh, real quick. What's the last? What's the first time you read this story? I have a. I think I'm. I could guess, but I, I wanted to hear you say it. Um, not too long after. Uh, after the group formed originally, the very first group with Angie and you mm. and Willie and um, Daniel Jacobson, and yeah. I read it. I read it, and I was like, on the one hand, I'm blown away by. The line by line level of writing. I mean, John Updike was second to fucking none, dude. He, like, you talk about building energy sentence by sentence and just the wiles of, of a voice and how the voice can be a performance. I don't know if there is a better story than this. It kind of is evocative, honestly, of uh, LaRocca's Uberman. Yeah, you know, that's a good at, comparison. My mother at the altar symbolism with the white wedding laughable against the evidence of my existence my heart here in the first pew of the chapels were behind me vaguely distantly the sounds of slot machines like like uh wedding bells or over here you got you know in walks these three girls and nothing but bathing suits i'm in the third checkout slot with my back to the door so i don't see them till they're over by the bread the one that caught my eye First was the one in the plaid green two piece, and she was a chunky can with a good tan and a sweet, broad, soft looking can with these two crescents of white just underneath it, where the sun never seems to hit at the top of the back of her legs. It's just like it's so evocative. The voice is just so powerful and so like he, um, so unique and original and. Um, it almost sounds like poetry, honestly, which is probably, oh, yeah. you know, it, it, it really is. Everything's an image. Everything in this fucking story is an image, man. And it really is a master class in um, not just line by line level writing, but in seeing everything that's going on in the story, being able to see and describe and render a whole universe with just your words, even, even something in it as innocuous as, Three girls in bathing suits walking through a grocery store becomes a kind of performance that um, the narrator is is telling. Every step that they make through the through the hall or through the aisles, um, and everything that's going on is just rendered through his psyche. Mm. And I mean, it's it's fucking gorgeous. It's gorgeous, but at the same time. After I read it, I was just like, I, I was kind of underwhelmed at the time as to what, uh, as to what happened. Right. You know, I was kind of underwhelmed. Like the, I mean, you, I mean, you, you fucking harp on me for not having a plot. Like literally, the plot of this story is these girls walk into a grocery store, pick this kid's lane to to buy their salmon. The manager comes out, gives them a hard time, doesn't kick him out, just gives them a hard time, and the narrator quits, right? And when he walks outside, he thinks that they're going to be waiting for him, but they're not. <laughs> and that's the story, <laughs> you know? Yeah, um, when, I, when I first read this, and by the way, I asked that because I thought it might have been in um, Winston's class, because I know you took Winston like before we yeah. all met. 
but Winston actually assigned this in our class, my class with him that same year I met you. Like, I think I took his class with, with Angie uh, that fall in 2011. And um, this was like the first story in, the, in my first literature class that I've ever taken. Because I, I think before then, before that semester, I was doing graphic design. I was trying to get a gra- graphic design degree. That's how lost I was back then. But this is my... So anyway, I meet y'all. Um, of course, we become friends over the summer. Like, real closer, close friends over the summer. Um, and then I take this class with Winston. And this is the... F- I, I just remember that just now. This, is, this was the first story he assigned. So besides, like, what I had read with you guys in La Roca, this is, like, the first story I ever read in an academic setting. And my thoughts back then... Well, one, I could barely read. So, like, it was hard to just understand words. So, like, all that stuff you're talking about, how beautiful the language is, I don't think that, like, really hit me. I knew it was easy, like, it was easier to read than certain things, right? It was obviously pretty plain spoken. Um, but yeah, I didn't really get that. And I, I, it kind of, it also fell flat for me, too, back then. I thought it was kind of a cool story, though, like, as far as, like, what it was plot wise how simple yeah. it could be like I, I i liked that like i appreciated it for that um but yeah i was like okay so he quit his job you know i do that all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but anyway but but like go like leaping from there to now like 12 years later you realize that that this is a point like a split in time for him you know it's between being one person and another a completely different yeah. person uh yeah. and it, and I think that's why Winston loved it so much. But I don't really remember. He did. He didn't really get into like. He he was more about loving. He's a poet first and foremost. So he's more about like he, he he was gushing over the language and the and the piece and like very specific moments. And there are like even for a short short story like this, there are some pretty pretty intense writing moments. Absolutely. Um, one of the ones that just when you were talking about it and gushing over it was like he does all these like it's effortless. That's the one. That's the word that comes to my mind. It feels effortless, but you get lines like the first time Queenie, the 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 main queen lady, the the most yeah. beautiful uh, of the three, first talks to him. He's like, all of a sudden, I slid right down her voice into her living room. Like he explains yeah. how it is to hear somebody's voice after you have like gain this idea of who they are um and then he goes into that line which is and that's transitioned to like an imagined scene in her living room and he even like talks about his own family a little bit um yeah. and it's all just like bang 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 and when he said uh U- uberman uh laraka's uh second version of uberman right that's the second one yeah that you were re- you're reciting um that's uh, yeah the uberman that's like john updike on like meth or something like obviously he was going a little bit like pushing it further like with an energy but that like energy and uh, is there in this and it's like constant throughout and um it is just it is kind of a joy to read honestly like just word for word sentence by sentence it's crazy right no it is it is 100 percent a master class i i can't think of a better short story for line by line writing off the top of my head. I can't, and I can't think, honestly, I can't think of a more yeah. simple short story. Um, yeah. So when I was reading this wise, you know? uh, today after, uh, yeah, plot, I was thinking about that. I was like, plot wise, this story is not going very far. I remember what happens. I don't really remember why it happens. And, I, and the why is the thing that yes. um, is moving. Yes, I mean, let's I talk about ex- the why. I wasn't expected to be moved by it like as much as I was, and I'm not saying it was a tearjerker or anything. It was just that you know you get kind of uh, your your ha- ha- hair gets set on fire a little bit when you read when you get to hey, the end of it. I gotta kick the dog out. Just fucking whining and whining and whining. Um, I'm gonna throw her in Leo's room. Leo's awake right now. Babe, can you? <laughs> You watch this dog for like 20 minutes. I want to walk her right after this reading. This thing is over. <laughs> Please, baby. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um. 
Okay, the why. The why is what everybody misses about this story. See, this is why I was wrong when I when I originally thought that there wasn't much depth to what was going on. Because he um he makes a judgment call. And it happens earlier than, than you might think as far as to what he's going to do. Um, and he misreads something. He misreads something. And that's the catalyst for the whole story. In fact, he's misreading something from the time she walks in and as she's walking around. He's not realizing something about the world and it's important and it's dark and it's sad. Um, and everybody kind of beats around the bush as to what the problem is that he's not misreading because see, here's what I teach my students. I teach them that what's left off the page sometimes is as important as what's left on the page. And you'll notice um, he like the description of her and his imaginings about what her life is like is fucking like like I said second to none. You know he even he even describes the way she comes down hard on her on her heels. Um, she kind of led them the other two peeking around and making their shoulders round. She didn't look around. Not this queen. She just walked straight on slowly. On these long white prima donna legs, she came down a little hard on her heels, as if she didn't walk in her bare feet that much. Putting her heels, and then letting the weight move along to her toes, as if testing the floor with every step, putting a deliberate, little deliberate action into it. You never knew for sure how girls' minds work. Which, by the way, there you go. <laughs> there you fucking go. There's the problem right there. I mean, he just he just says it off the top of his head. Right. You, really, um, you never really know for sure how girls' minds work. You really think it's a mind in there, just a little buzz like a bee in a glass jar. But you got the idea she had talked the other two into coming there with her, and now she was showing them how to do it. Walk slow and hold yourself straight. Which might be true, honestly. Um, that's not the part that he misreads. So he's... He may be right about, uh, he's definitely right, I think, in, in assuming that she's the alpha of the pack. And he's right about them being nervous. But he's wrong about two things. All right. Um, okay. This is, this, is the why, this is the why of the story. All right. Um, and this is kind of the, this is the thing that people don't think about in life, too. Um, so when, his boss, so the narrator, uh, name I can't off the top of my head remember. We have, uh, a, we have a narrator, we have a friend. Um, I, don't, I don't think he ever says his name, dude, does he? Oh, wait, it's probably at the end. Yeah, it's probably at the end when he says you're making a mistake. Yeah. Um, uh, hang on one second. Sammy. Sammy, Sammy. is his name. And... Uh, yeah, did you say something, Sammy? There's another character, um, Stokes, 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 Stokes. Stokes. Uh, what a name! Who's, who's just fucking awesome? Oh, daddy, I feel so faint, darling. I said, hold me tight. Yeah, a lifer, um, right? He's a uh, well, he's 22, yeah. but he's married, two kids. Yep, and I was 19 this April, but I, the narrator's single. Um. Yes. Anyways, plot is so Stokesky and him are joking around, you know, about being uh, head over heels in love with these women, which is it's kind of it's more a joke on Stokesky's part, I think, than on Sammy's. Sammy really is a little bit infatuated with what he considers to be their brazen attitude, just coming to the store. Mm-hmm. And then their boss comes out. Well, first, hang on. As they come out of the aisles with uh, their kippers, right? Was it kippers that they had? <laughs> Dude. Herring, fancy herring snacks. 
flash in her in her blue eyes. Um, go ahead. What were you gonna say? All right, you said some. You said that um, he misreads or is wrong about two things or one yeah, thing. Two what were things. you getting at there? Are you leading up to that? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm getting up to that. So here's the first thing that he misreads. Huh? They come out of the aisle with their um, fancy herring, and there there's two registers open, and they pick his. All right. And he thinks that's significance. He thinks that they had a choice between Stokesky and me, and they chose me, and that means something. Well, um, I don't know. I read it. I read it differently. I um, th- wasn't it just he he renders it as luck? No, like it Stokesky's bad luck uh, turned into his. It was just kind of chance that he got to see them. I don't. I mean, we could kind of read it. Maybe. Yeah, where's the line at? <laughs> See, there's a line in there. All right, it's page uh, four, top of four, second paragraph. I'm not sure if you have the same copy as me, but the paragraph starts as then everybody's luck begins to run out. Uh, oh no, no, no! Sorry, that's way, way beyond. Um, oh, we could read the whole fucking thing if she had to. Um, I know. <sighs> <clears throat> All right, now he comes. Okay, so here's here's where I think it happens. Now here, this is a uh, second page, bottom of the uh, bottom of the page, paragraph that starts. Now here comes the sad part of the story. At yeah, least my that's... family say it's sad, but I I didn't think I don't think it's sad myself. The store is empty. Um. The store is pretty empty, it's, it being Thursday afternoon. So there was nothing much to do except lean on the register and wait for the girls to show up again. The whole store was like a pinball machine. I didn't know which tunnel they'd come out of. After a while, they came out from the far aisle around the light bulbs, records, at discounts of the Caribbean Six or Tony Martin Sings or some such gunk. You wonder... They waste the wax on six packs of candy bars and plastic toys done up in cellophane that falls apart when a kid looks at them anyways. Anyway, they come. Queenie's still leading Here it is. Uh, the way and holding a little gray jar in her hand. Slot three through seven are unmanned, and I could see her wandering, wandering between Stokes and I. But Stokey, with his usual luck, draws and... Um, uh, old party in baggy gray pants who stumbles up with four giant cans of pineapple juice. What do these bums do with all the pineapple juice? I'm often, I've often asked myself. So the girls come to me. Yeah, Queen I see what you're saying. Down. I kind of see what you're saying now because it says I see her wondering as if she's making a decision, and he's chalking yep. it up to her decision and Stokesy's bad luck. Yep. Um. So she gets the uh, fancy herring, pure sour cream. Her hands, he's looking at her hands. And then everybody's luck runs out. Langle comes in from haggling mm-hmm. with a truck full of cabbages on the lot. And it's about to scuttle into the door mark manager behind which he hides all day when the girl's touch his eye, which, by the way, is a beautiful way of saying that he saw that they touch his eye. Lingle is pretty dreary. He teaches Sunday school and the rest, but he doesn't miss much. He comes over and says, girls, this isn't the beach. Um, and Queenie, and she's like, my mother asked me to pick up these herring jacks with a voice that startles me. And there's the part where you're talking about where he's thinking of her living room and how nice it must be in there. And he goes, right. Let's, he doesn't even kick her out. He just says, that's all right, Lingle says, but this isn't the beach. <laughs> <laughs> his repeating this struck me as funny as if it had just occurred to him he had been thinking all these years A&P was this great big tune <laughs> and he was a dead lifeguard he didn't like my smiling as I said he didn't miss much but he concentrates but, on giving the girls th- that sad Sunday school superintendent stare you got Queen's that blood. 
Go ahead. You got you got that line. You got the Dune line. The line you said about um his eye, just a little thing like when the girls touch his eye, like it all just kind of. When I say effortless, I wrote. I think that's what I wrote it down when I was reading th- those three paragraphs. Effortless because it just comes so naturally. It's no, uh, there's no artifice to it. You know, it's, just, it's beautiful. Wow. But it's beautiful also for, it's also like sardonic. Right. It's also it's also um, kind of biting in a way. It's giving you so much of his personality, um, and so much of his outlook on life, and, and just a whimsical like satire that teenagers must feel they inhibit when they're in the world. Anyways, Queenie's blush is no sunburn now. A plump one in plaid that I like better from the back. Really sweet can pipes up. We weren't doing any shopping. We just came in for the one thing. That makes no difference, Langle tells her, and I could see from the way his eyes went that he hadn't noticed she was wearing a two-piece before. We want you decently dressed when you come in here. We are decent, Queenie says suddenly, her lower lip pushing, getting sore now that she remembers her place, a place from which the crowd that runs the A.M.P. must look pretty crummy. Fancy herring snacks flashed in her very blue eyes. Girls, I don't want to argue with you. After this, you come in here with your shoulders covered. It's our policy. He turns his back. That's policy for you. Policy is what the kingpins want. All the others want juvenile delinquency. Anyways, uh, the guy quits Sammy mm-hmm. after after the girls leave. And John Updike being John Updike. <laughs> oh, Lang was giving him shit over it. <laughs> Did you say something, Sammy? I said I quit. This is the last page. I thought you did. You didn't have to embarrass them. And Lingle says it was they who were embarrassing us. <laughs> it's <And> like, nah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, see, that's the mature lesson that's, that's the other thing that he didn't catch. Um, that nobody catches when they're 19, but you catch it when you're, when you're 30 and you're 40. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if I caught it. What do you mean by that? Well, John, how were how were they embarrassing? What do you think Langle meant when he said they were embarrassing us? They were like disrespecting the establishment by not wearing enough clothing. All right. Yes. Um, how is that disrespectful, though? I think it's disrespectful to the person like uh Lang- langley um uh lingle rather <laughs> it's disrespectful uh, to everybody the in there there's a reason it's disrespectful to everybody in there including stokes all right um and we don't catch it with women as much as as quickly as you would if it was a dude who was doing it but I want you to imagine, John, that uh, what are you doing these days? You're like, oh, you're driving for Uber. Okay. And um, let's say you're driving for, or you're driving, or you're driving for whoever, and you got the little thing up, right? And um, well, you're, dr- you're delivering food, but it doesn't well, matter. I don't, I, don't think, I don't think I do that enough to get a, a thing to put up. <laughs> do they do that for people? They give them a little. I don't money. know. <laughs> well, let's just say, let's just say, uh, let's just say that they did. And let's say you're okay. Let's let, you're working. It doesn't matter. You're working, right? Okay. And you're working late at night. I know you're in. You're in South Carolina, so it's not as likely to happen as if you're down in Miami. But let's say you're at a light, and at the next light, um, up pulls a fucking Lamborghini with the top down. And the Lamborghini's full of, like, these 20-year-old fucking cunts who are all in bathing suits and are all just laughing their ass off and taking pictures of each other and fucking dancing on the hood of the car and and they drive off. How have they just disrespected you? 
you know, this is a better metaphor. Well, that's a, actually a pretty good metaphor. But I felt this a lot when I was working at uh, Biltmore, just serving as a being a servant, you know, and that's yeah. kind of what you are in a in a shopping center, right? Even uh, Lingle, even though he's like running the place, he still has to be the cashier when needed, you know, when somebody quits randomly. Um, and he's put in his place or it's not really it's not really put in your place. It's just what you're saying is they're flaunting their privilege like they had they, they're they have the privilege to walk into a place half naked and walk out like even if they even if it's against the rules, they're not going to, you know, be punished for it. Their life right. is ahead of them. They have so much yeah. more potential for like an extravagant or a good life than this guy who runs the uh, the supermarket probably does. I mean, you saw it all the time at FSU and FAU, like these fucking frat boys right. running around like, you know, they, they don't give a fuck about college. They're just in there because mommy and daddy want them to be. They're not paying for any of the classes. You saw it when you were teaching, I'm sure. You know. Oh, yeah, um, man. Yes, but it, it, you're right, though, especially at the universities like FAU, FSU. UCS. Way more, way more over there because students are, they know that as soon as they leave, they have a hundred thousand dollar a year job lined up or two hundred thousand yeah. dollar a year job lined up. Not only that, but they got a fucking mansion to go back to, you know. I mean, yeah, when I mean, you're, you, when you're you saw things. with these fucking bitches, like I remember one time. We're in, uh, I'm in the, I'm waiting for class to start. This chick's uh, leaning against uh, the hallway wall. She's like, guess what? My boyfriend's taking me to Aspen this weekend to fucking hang out in his mansion. She like gives a fist bump to her friend. And I'm like, you fucking cunt, dude. Like, (laughs) you know, these kids are writing about going to the Bahamas and... So I mean, this uh, I read today. This kid's writing about going to Spain and the um, the Galapagos and all this shit. Yeah, it's like they don't realize or care how hard people work around them, you know. And the disrespect is—it's not even like they're intentionally um being disrespectful per se they're it's just by virtue of their privilege they're disrespecting everything around them i don't think queenie went in there to go shit on anybody no 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 but she weren't thinking weren't thinking yeah but she did because everybody was working there everybody in that establishment is working because they have to and the third thing by the way Oh shit! Um, so there's a third thing that the narrator oh, doesn't crack. <laughs> so oh, number shit. one, he thinks Queenie chose him, which I still haven't explained just how dumb that is. Number two, he doesn't realize that Queenie's disrespecting everyone around him, and number three, uh, he doesn't realize that. Uh, he actually really fucking needed that job. <laughs> you know, he really needed that job because he doesn't have the privilege that Queenie has. Right. He, he right? just wanted to feel it for just a moment. That's that's what he did there. And I think you, you and I probably know that feeling all too well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like you just want that one moment of agency over your life. You know, that one day, you know, you have a day, yeah. right? And then the next day you wake up and you're like, shit, I'm not going to get a paycheck. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah i mean that's when you're young and younger i guess i mean i, you, I still do it sometimes i did it with bill Moore, <laughs> but no i just i i did have a um a, 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 kind of some privilege you know because laura had a job at that point damn well, i mean me and you are so lucky I don't know we are so lucky. because because uh i mean if you want to talk about like real work these people who do the landscaping around oh, you, right. and do the con- like do the uh, the con- well the concrete mixing and pouring and shaping and right. just the construction. Like what that yeah. world is is so far removed from academia, which is kind of a, a which is a privilege in and of itself too. But academia, um, even like yeah. 
any that's you know you did it you could <laughs> speak to how much harder it is to do that even than another shitty job like working in a restaurant or something oh yeah man um but yeah so she chose his uh chose his lane and he thought it meant something and that's really the tragedy of the story that this guy cannot read social cues at all because even if he didn't realize that um she was disrespecting every or they're disrespecting everybody in there and uh, even if he didn't realize that he really needed this job man why the fuck did he think that she would be out there waiting for him after he quit you know um this is the the part of the story that kills me like reading it is that this guy's job is literally like to call somebody a grocery store clerk is a fucking pejorative dude <laughs> you know it's like an, it's an insult to call somebody that um, in this society, unfortunately. Because when COVID happened, by the way, holy shit, they were essential workers. They were gods, you know? Like, right. Like the people who provide you food, like, holy shit, if I don't have food, I fucking just starve to death because nobody in this country knows how to go hunt or n nobody in this country, like, for the most part, where we live, anyways, knows how to grow food. <laughs> so, right, you know, yeah, we, we know nothing about agriculture. We know nothing about hunting. Yeah, you're just about so to, you, you mentioned earlier, like landscaping, hard labor. They're at the bottom uh, socially, but they're like making everything happen. Yeah, that's so like everything. that anywhere you work. By the way, the you, the people at the bottom being paid the least are doing all the real work. Yep. Everybody else is just fucking talking and pushing numbers around, and you know, yep. Jesus Christ, sending emails and shit, and doing meetings, and fuck out of here. How it goes? You ever see a uh, Apocalypse Now? By the way. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, remember how it ends where um, Martin Sheen mm -hmm. finally confronts Marlon Brando, and Marlon Brando asks him, like. Covered in shadow because he's too fat to actually be. <laughs> Kurt, Is that why? Colonel Kurt, yeah, they had, to, they had to hide him in shadow, and he's like, it somehow works. <laughs> yeah, it just works because he's Marlon Brando. But he's like, um, right. Yeah, he, he asked Martin Sheen's character. Uh, he goes, "Are you an assassin?" <laughs> Martin good. Sheen's character goes, "I'm a soldier." And Marlon Brando, Colonel Kurt goes, uh, "You're neither." You're a message boy for grocery store clerks. Um, <laughs> dude, it's a fucking insult to call it like it's. It's basically saying you're just you're a peon, you're a nothing. That's what being a grocery store clerk is. And by the way, you and I both know this because I worked at fucking Chick Fil A and you've worked at Staples. You know, like yeah, um, same, same damn thing, basically. Well, yeah, Laura, I mean, Laura, Laura actually was a grocery store clerk at Publix. When right, I was in Tallahassee. you got to how shitty people treat you there. Oh yeah, like yeah. people would you, they'd be like, hold out your hand. This old guy would be like, hold out your hand, or no, no, he would hold out his hand with the change. He's like, take your change. And Laura's like confused. What? He, and he puts the hand closer and like shakes it a little bit, and he wants her to pick out the change that he owes, to make it even or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, fuck that. yeah, dude. When I heard that, I was just like, I want to murder that person. <laughs> that that is, <laughs> oh. but Lord, uh, yeah, people would just throw money, like throw dollar bills at you. It's like, okay, all right, I see. It. Yeah, all right. Just then they, the pandemic they would... comes, and those same people are like, "We need you. I'm not going to do it. No, <laughs> I'm not going to risk yep. my life to." take money from people uh, to check people out to, you know, stock the shelves. No way in hell. I'm all, I also, I am useless because I can't make my own food. I have to buy it. You know, like, and that's everybody, of course, but we aren't even, we aren't even hunter or gatherers anymore. We're just consumers. We just consume. 
Yeah. Uh, what's been provided to us by strangers. We buy you know? our food, and we, like most of us our age, rent our houses. You know, we're just buying shit, con- like, you know, feeding the goddamn beast constantly yep. with every dime. And if we don't have it, we go into debt. That's a whole nother, like, for form of consumerism, it's like being consumed by the consumerist culture. It's crazy. Yep. It's it's really depressing, Craig, to think about this. Thank you. <laughs> That's just what all I do, isn't it? It's just I know. Depressed. That's why I exist. That's what... <laughs> I love like, this damn job. story. I didn't even think. I didn't. That whole point that you're making is obvious. It's obviously there. Like I wasn't thinking about that at all when, when he said that line. It was they who embarrassed us. But like that's what yeah. makes this a great story because it has both has three sides to the story, you know. It has like, oh, they were just dumb teenagers getting a thing for their mom. Oh, he was just a kid that decided he didn't want to work this shitty job anymore, and he, he knew, he, you know, he either gets worse, which the story kind of hints at his life's gonna get worse, or he figures out a way to make it work. And then there's the guy that the company man, right, who's there. Yeah. He's stuck there. There's no choice for him. He's being disrespect. He was being embarrassed by them. Um, yeah, it's just like it's so multi. It's such a weird thing to say about a sh- such a short story that is all in scene. There's none of this yeah. is being told to you. This is all just there. Um, yep. When you talk about it ad nauseum, you know it's when you're writing true, right? That's what you like to say. Yeah. When you're writing true, it all is going to be there. It's just just by virtue of rendering things truly. He rendered that store manager truly. He rendered that boy cashier truly, and those girls as well. He wasn't like imposing some kind of view on the situation. I mean, I guess that's the 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 good thing about it being written in first person. He he has to state the view of the kid. And you get his view, but there is like the writer view too, like the layer on top of it, uh, making sure that things are, you know, not going off the rails with this kid's view of the world. Um, crazy man, that's 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 pretty insightful, dude. Yeah, well, we talked about this story a lot uh, last semester. I mean, it's great. It's really, really great. It's really, really complex. In spite of steaming, it's, oh. it almost seems like it's a real an quick, early it's a, grad story, you know, because nobody's dying. And, um, you mean like for him? Just, right, uh, like sorry, what? For, the, for the writer, like an early grad story, like that you want to read? Yeah. I, well, I, no, I just mean like, so an early grad story. Meaning, um, it, it's it feels like a story with almost no consequence, you know. Uh, and you don't think about it too much, on because like I said, on the surface, it's not there. Like, what's at stake for this kid? It, it feels like it's just this job, you know. It's just this job that's at stake for him, and and the job was just being a shitty grocery store clerk. So, fuck that job, right? But it's not just the job. I mean, it is the job, but it's also, um, it's also this kid's pride. You know, he uh, he's very proud for somebody who is just a grocery store clerk. Like honestly, and it's it's a statement on the society too. Like, um, like not to be over, not to be overly general generalizing, but. You take Johnny Depp, or you take um, whoever whoever is like uh, Brad Pitt, and you put them in a Publix, and you strip away their fame, and you put them, you put an apron on them, and you put them at the cashier's register. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, they're probably gonna, you know, they'll probably be flirting with the other customers and shit. But if some rich bitch walked by. She probably wouldn't look at them twice, you know? I mean, I see these gorgeous people at fucking Publix um, and, and wherever, sometimes Target, uh, McDonald's, and 
in a way, it kind of lowers your esteem of them. That, especially if you know, if they're not sixteen or seventeen, if they're like twenty, twenty-five, thirty, you know, it doesn't matter how good you're looking. If you're working at a fucking, um, <laughs> if you're working at an IHOP, you know, people just don't look at you the same. Especially if you're a man, dude. You know, um, yeah. What, remember when I told you I was door dashing? You're like, you're not like anything. You know what it's like. Uh, but uh, I was so ashamed of it <laughs> for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> it's if it feels shameful to be like an older person. You know, even though I'm not like, dip, you know, it's not like I know some people like really, really fucking door dash or really Uber. You know, it's they have to uh, do it like do it all day, and that's like. I think it's a different league. Like, uh, you know, we talked about it earlier. It's a different, it's like a, a kind of a privilege to our, our situation. You know, we have an education, you're, you know, you're teaching and uh, I have a, a, a W2 job as they say. Um, but yeah, man, like it, it does when you're serving, when you're just serving, you know, you're like doing kind of like the, the, the low, low, like, even at Biltmore, man, you're, 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 you know, I don't know if I ever showed you what I wore when I worked there. <laughs> Do I want to see it? <laughs> no, you don't. It's like, Dude, when, you I was, know, when I was working at Chick fil A, I had a candy striped fucking pink and white fucking collar shirt. All right, wasn't that bad? That I had, to keep, <laughs> that I had to keep tucked into some black slacks. And on top of that, I wore um a bright green. Like lime green um, safety belts, so that people could see me walking in and out of the parking lot. And it's like these little twenty-year-olds telling me, "Hey, Craig, don't forget your safety belt." Hey, Craig, where's your name tag at? It's like, are you fucking kidding me, yeah, dude? Yeah, fuck that shit. And I go home. My dad would be like, "I'm like, yeah, I quit Chick Fil A. Fuck that job." My dad's like, "Why? Why would you quit there?" It's like, "Cause I have a fucking master's degree, dude." <laughs> you know, <laughs> but um, my dad's very working class. Like, yeah. Having a job is always better than not having a job. It doesn't matter how shitty it is. But uh, I don't know. Probably, that's, how he, that's how he felt about his kids, anyways. But um, but yeah, I, this kid. My my point being, dude, if if being like if me and you met people while we were in that uniform, we would never assume that they'd suddenly become enamored with us or or some great virtue of of quitting a job on their behalf. You know, we would never think that would lead to something. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I, honestly, like I'm, I'm so, like, I'm surprised people say anything to me at all. When I'm, when well, I'm working on shitty jobs. Think about like how he describes the way that Queenie pushes back. She's uh, and you read this, but she says we are decent. Queenie says suddenly, her lower lip pushing, getting sore now that she rem- remembers her place, a place from which the crowd that runs the AMP must look pretty crummy. Yes. So he's he's he is like, I think he is just being a fucking punk. Honestly, like he's thinking about he he has probably a dad like yours, you know, working class. Um, and he's trying to just take some power back, take a moment back. He wants, he doesn't want to be this, this guy that works at a crummy place. He doesn't want to be uh lingual when he's 40, you know, he wants something greater, but the tragedy is kind of like you said, there isn't much greater, you know, without an education, there's another are... job like that one, maybe in the immediate future, but yeah, dude, uh, Pekowski has a whole book just on, just on this concept of quitting jobs <laughs> and getting really? other ones, quitting them. Yeah, it's called factotum, which means factotum is like uh, a synonym for a handyman. Just somebody who somebody who has a lot of different trades. And I mean, he just worked everywhere uh, after um, he got out of high school. And he basically hated all of them <laughs> until yeah. he got stuck in the post office. And he got stuck there for like 20 years, which he also oh, wasn't that long. Yeah, yeah, he was there for a long time. Um, but I wonder he just went off the fucking rails when he got big. <laughs> oh yeah, it was had a lot of time to make up for there. Um. 
I don't know. It's 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 so seemingly. So the problem is, it seems really shallow, but is actually incre- an incredibly complex story about social class and about gender studies and about um, kids' pride, you know, at war with itself, and so so he's so fragile that. Um, that he's he's willing to throw away a job to keep it, <laughs> you know. Because the truth is, he's a lot more like Lindell than he thinks. And in fact, according to the girls, like they aren't looking at Lindell any different than they're looking at him. In fact, out of the two of them, they'd probably look and listen to him more, and they'd probably be more intrigued by Lindell than some dolt who just threw his job away. You know, right. um, well, they they do actually like stop, like Lindell stop, uh, stops them, kind of like gets their uh, heart beating a little bit, like oh, am I in trouble type of thing? Like they blush, yeah. you know. Yeah. So out of the two of them, they're looking at Lindell, like oh, who's this guy over here? You know, um, it's not to say they're they're not enamored with him or anything, but, um. Like that's the that's the painful part of the story, and also, by the way, what's sad about it is that he still doesn't get it. You know, it's, so it's a dramatic irony, um, or at least it's a it's a dramatic irony if you're old enough to recognize the irony that his family's right. That man, if they'd have just gone to the other to the other um aisle he might have been spared so much of his own stupidity, you know, <laughs> voiced by your own batard kind of thing. Oh, no, it would have um, happened eventually. That's inevitable. It always guy. does. It always does. But, you know, that's that's the thing about life. is One way or another, stupidity is always shown to you. Um, I don't know. It's It's so great for that. It's so great for... You know, thinking about how oh, it's also like it's so it's not just uh, about gender studies, but it's also about class. It's also about the society and how and how we uh, shit on so-called uh, essential workers and just people mm-hmm. who work that, that job in general, and about. You know the the stupidity of being a teenager, and and how fucking fragile your pride is. I don't know. It's great, man, and it's all wrapped up in this beautiful fucking, um, this right. beautiful sentences. Yeah, nothing. None of it would have mattered if it wasn't written the way it's been written here. Gosh, he was only thirty when he wrote this, man. Jesus, way to make me feel like shit. Well, Thanks, every Brad. year that goes by. <laughs> 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 hey, you don't want to like look into Hemingway. <laughs> and, uh, and on the other hand, girl. on the other hand, I think this is best story. So, um, yeah. So, in a way, that's kind of uh, that's definitely his best short story. I mean, I tried to read some of his other ones, and they're nowhere near this. But, um, but this one is great. Um, I'm glad you picked it. All right. Oh, well, you mentioned it last week. I was like, yeah, that story. Huh? It's been a while. You mentioned it when you were, like, blathering <laughs> through text <laughs> message about Borges. You're like, man, it's fucking... Let's do John up. Like, nah, fuck that. We're going to do Borges. Because, you know, we need to read some weird <laughs> shit. <laughs> Dude, I was reading it again today, man. It's so good, and it's so weird. Yeah. Apparently, it's a detective story. I don't know what parts of that story you're supposed to, like look back and wonder who did what. It seems like it's pretty obvious who did everything, but yeah, I don't know. Weird. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe we'll come back to it at some point and with a deeper understanding. We can just do that. We can redo ones we've already done <laughs> and do them uh, better. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, no, nah, we're, we're stuck with what we got there. <laughs> That's it. <All> right. <laughs> now nah, you, what you could, well, what you're doing it already you're talking about it again with a deeper understanding. So yeah, that's what I mean, that's, we got to fun of reading. Isn't it is 
as you get older and as you read more, you're able to extract more from uh, the fruits, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't, wanna, I don't know if about... I want to be at your level, dude. I was happy with the story until we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Well, <laughs> in 30 more years, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll have, maybe we'll be able to talk about it and you'll be optimistic again. <laughs> By the way, uh, I really, really want to talk about the short story by Alice Monroe called Winlock Edge. Um, What's it called? Winlock Edge. Uh, it's the name of a poem that uh, one of the characters has to read in the story. Um, What's the first word? Winlock. W E N L O. Okay. Winlock Edge. Got it. I'll send it to you. Uh, dude, it's great. It's so good. Um, There's another one, by the way. Angie sent me like the first year we started we started all this, and I read it, and I really wasn't all that impressed, and I read it last night. And I was like, oh my fucking god, dude, Jesus Christ, it's so good. Dude, speaking it's- of Winston's class, the first time I ever read Alice Monroe was in that class. Yeah. I forget um, what story it was. Met, first time I met my husband. That was the one you read. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, and I was reading it at Chris's house. Yeah, I was I like, I was like, fuck this story. Give me another beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can't read Alice Monroe drinking. It's, I remember it's I was like trying to be careful and like, all right, I'll have one beer. I only have two beers while I read this story. <laughs> then it just went off the rails. And yeah. the th- I was reading it because I think the next day, because the class is on Saturday, I think the next day I was going there in the morning trying to talk about that thing. But hey, as C.K. C. Williams uh, said in the po- in the gas station poem, I didn't have two words in my head at that time yeah. to rub together, yeah. much less an entire Alice Monroe story. And I and you tried to read her again with hate ship, love ship, friendship, uh, Oh yeah, I, I've come to appreciate. I mean, you tried to read her again with Floating Bridge. <laughs> you kind of pretty much always hated her. <laughs> no, well, uh-huh. she's not like she was never my style. This is my style. The writing is just so energetic, and she's so like yeah. long winded. But she could tell a damn story. I always knew that, at least. Yeah, she's very so. She's 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 basically the opposite of everyone we've read so far. So much as um Hemingway like boom 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 you know the story is this big bombastic thing usually even if it's not even in the case of the two big hearted river I mean short sentences you're building this energy and you're talking you know it's it's there's this kind of like tensions being built and um fucking John Updike I mean just like fireworks for fucking sentences mm-hmm. Um, Ron Carlson, fucking, um, just like a million miles an hour with that fucking, uh, with, um, what was it called? Um, uh, um, Ordinary Sun? No, well, that's, and, um, a kind of flying. Kind of flying. You know? yeah, yeah, both of those, really, just like Ordinary Sun. I mean, Ordinary Sun might be the only short story that line by line is better for me than, um, AMP, honestly. A and P has more, way more of a reputation, and A and P is probably honestly the better story told all through scene. Um, but I, ordinary I son, just fucking gorgeous, man, gorgeous writing. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is. It probably is the most gorgeous writing of of the lot so far. I mean, this is up there. I don't know. It's tough, and a po- like it's hard to compete with certain poems. Um. They're both really funny too, so they're both almost like cousins of each other. Um, yeah. Ordinary Sun and A and P. Yeah, they both have a lot of humor in them in the writing. Yeah. The humor is the humor is prevalent throughout. Whereas Alice Monroe, the voice, um, <laughs> I mean, there this this short this short story in particular, I think, is pretty funny, but it's a lot more mature in a, in a lot of respects than anything. Um, we've read so far. Like this, this is the first two paragraphs. They're both really short. My cousin yeah. had a bachelor. My mother had a bachelor cousin, a good deal younger than her. He used to visit us on the farm every summer. He brought along his mother, Aunt Nell Botts. 
His own name was Ernie Botts. He was a tall, florid man with a good-natured expression, a big square face, and fair, curly hair springing straight up from his forehead. His hands, his fingernails were as clean as soap itself. His hips were a little plump. My name for him, when he was not around, was Ernest Bottom. I had a mean song. But I meant no harm, or hardly any harm. You know? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This, by the way, can already already tell as you're reading this out loud, the voice a little sinister, but you know, getting these big, giant, bombastic fucking sentences. She doesn't write with that kind of energy. She writes a lot more patient and methodical. They both um, have this, um, like person to person ness about them. You know, like someone we used to say it all the time. It's like somebody just, just telling you a story across the table or something. Yeah, uh, you can almost imagine her just sitting at a table and kind of laughing as she's telling the story, at, like while she's like admitting to the nickname she had to him, you know, to a stranger or something. Uh, oh, and that's, and that's, that's I felt that way reading this story too, because uh, you know it's first person and it's very like effortlessly told as if somebody's talking. Um, but I think a lot of great stories have that too. Yep, I think a lot of them know. don't, but you know. <laughs> A lot of them yeah. feel like they're just Jorge being told from God doesn't. or something. Or yeah. Hayes does not feel like it's some something that you're just being told across the right. table. It feels Jorge like a dream like... happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Hayes feels like you're in a fucking dream. And the thing like the you're not even so much reading the words for the language, you're just like trying to uh grasp what's happening as it's happening. Um it's just to show you the versatility of fiction. We talk about it, it's so much more obvious in poetry because poem the poems look and just are completely different. Uh, and you think fiction is fiction, but nah, man, fiction is just as compl- complicated and complex and can be vastly different one story to the next. And they al- almost all are. I mean, we talk about it all the time. Anomalies, right? All the great stories feel like anomalies. Um, even if they do similar things to each other and they're in similar styles... They could be completely different styles, but they always feel like special in a way that's unreproducible. Yep. It, but, there was uh, some just, just say quoi about yeah, and about the art itself. About the art itself. Let's w- let's do the. Um, we want to do that story then next time. Yes, yeah, that's a little bit longer, John. Warned you. I think it's oh, I know it's pages. fucking Alice Munro. It's going to be a half a novel <laughs> for a short story, twenty pages. But uh, I think you'll appreciate it. <laughs> I think All you'll right. read this one and you'll be like, "Wow, you know." Uh, I can't believe I just read twenty pages of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, probably the first thing I'll say. Like, no, I'm just kidding. All right. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, at, at some point, every book club has to read Alice Munro. And this is our point, all right? So we'll get it out of the way, and then we'll go back to uh, Joe Bolton and Hemingway. And, uh, we should we should do a poetry one, just like not just one person, but like I'll pick like three banger yeah, poems yeah. that we both know yeah. really well. Pick ones that I've never no pick ones that I've never read any before. You okay, know, like tell me on how. Brilliant they are, because at some point I'm going to make you read James Dick Sheep Child. I'm going to try and convince you. I've read it. What are you talking about? Oh, I yeah, know you've yeah, read yeah. it. I just want to. I want to convince you that it's brilliant. That's the tough part. <laughs> I think. Uh, right. I think. I don't think it will be that hard. But uh, all right. All right, man. All right. I'll talk hey, to congrats, you. Congrats, dude, about that other thing. All right. Yeah. Hey. Uh, more. <laughs> Not that other thing we were talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah, the thing. What are you talking about? Hey, come on. <laughs> this is public. Uh... <laughs> All right, man. I'll talk to you later. All right, All right bye. Bye. Later.